for joining me. My name is Mindy Mandel, and this channel is called All About Platonism. Here I talk about Plato's dialogues, and I invite you to leave comments or questions or some brilliant insight that you might have had while you were watching. And today we're going to talk about the dialogue Gorgias. Okay, so the Gorgias introduces what some people call a Socratic paradox. And this paradox has two parts to it. So first, it is better to be wronged than to do wrong. And then secondly, for those who do do wrong, it's better to be punished than not to be punished. Well, certainly this is the way we raise our children. We see children who are unruly and they never get punished and we think that's bad parenting. So we treat children this way, but when it comes to adults, we have a different idea. In fact, many people's fantasy is to do wrong and get away with it. There are countless Hollywood movies built on the fantasy of committing the perfect crime, which is the epitome of doing wrong and getting away with it. So today we're going to look at why Socrates says this, and he does not think he's being naive by saying it. Okay, to get into this first, let's take a look at who Gorgias was. Gorgias of Leontini, and Leontini was in Sicily. He lived a very long time. He lived to 105 years old, and he was a rhetorician, which means that he traveled around the Greek world teaching the skills of persuasion. He called it an art, and he was so good at it that he had countless imitators. And by the way, this little bit of biographical detail comes from Deborah Nails in a book called The People of Plato. Socrates did not have a very high opinion of rhetoric, and he made no secret of it. Early in the dialogue, he says that rhetoric has no need to know the truth about things, but merely to discover a technique of persuasion, so as to appear among the ignorant to have more knowledge than the experts. By the way, all of our translations today come from the translator William Dudley uh, Woodhead. Okay, um, so he says this to Gorgias, and Gorgias is not only not offended, but he agrees, and he says, yes, that's exactly what rhetoric is, and ain't it grand? He says, is this not a great comfort, Socrates, to be able, without learning any other arts but this one, to prove in no way inferior to the specialists? So he's very proud of what he does. He thinks it's a good thing. But Socrates makes no secret of how he feels. And then in one exchange with a student of Gorgias's, who also plays a prominent role in this dialogue, a guy named Polis, Polis asks him what kind of art rhetoric is, according to Socrates. And Socrates' response is, to tell you the truth, Polis, rhetoric is no art at all. He goes on to call it a kind of routine. He says that it's a routine that produces gratification and pleasure. Okay, now from here, Socrates is going to create a number of analogies. And to keep these all straight, I'm going to give you a little chart. He's going to divide them into what he calls arts and what he calls flattery. So when he's talking about arts, he means those, excuse me, those things that focus on what is truly good. Whereas flattery is more of an imitation of the arts. It aims at what is pleasant, ignoring the good. Okay, so once dividing things into arts and their imitations or the flattery, he's then going to divide those that are for the body and those that are for the soul. And then we're going to see four on each side. Okay, so dealing first with flattery, he talks about cookery, for the body and rhetoric for the soul. Now with cookery here, he's not talking about doctors or cooks who have some medical training who are nutritionists and who it's kind of trendy now to try to make healthy foods that also taste good. I don't think that was a thing in Plato's day. So what Socrates is talking about here by cookery is creating meals and snacks that taste good but they aren't necessarily healthy. And Socrates says, there exists, I maintain, both in body and in soul, 
a condition which creates an impression of good health in each case, although it is false. And so he says that cookery creates this impression or illusion of good health in the body, and rhetoric creates this impression of good health that is false in the soul. Okay, so cookery and rhetoric are the flattery. The arts that they are imitating, then, would be medicine and justice. Now, Socrates was not naive. He understood that the flatterers were more popular than the people that Socrates would call the true artists. In comparing the cooks to the doctors, he says, if a cook and a doctor had to contend in the presence of children, which of the two, doctor or cook, was an expert in wholesome and bad food? Well, that poor doctor would starve to death. Okay, let's go to the other side of the chart, and I'll give you all four of them. The arts, he says, are gymnastics and legislation. And gymnastics covers all forms of exercise, including wrestling, I think, is also considered part of gymnastics. And then on the, on the side of flattery, he has beautification and sophistry. So here's a quote comparing beautification to gymnastics. He says, gymnastics is impersonated by beautification. And he defines beautification as a mischievous, de deceitful, mean, and ignoble activity, which cheats us by shapes and colors, thereby causing people to take on an alien charm to the neglect of the natural beauty produced by exercise. So he had a very low opinion of beautification, and they didn't even have botics in his day. Um, I was trying to find a quote that would compare legislation and sophistry. Um, he doesn't actually say a whole lot about sophistry, except to acknowledge that it's often confused with rhetoric. Sophist and rhetorician, working in the same sphere and upon the same subject matter, tend to be confused with each other. Okay, even though he did not give us a direct quote, he does give us these analogies. You can match each section to its corresponding section in the other area. So medicine corresponds to cookery and gymnastics to beautification, justice to rhetoric, legislation to sophistry. And so using this format, you can create some analogies. For example, you can take justice and rhetoric and say justice is to rhetoric as legislation is to sophistry. Maybe you remember doing this in school. So we would have something like this, and then we can see what the relationship would be, that rhetoric is the imitation of justice, and sophistry is the imitation of legislation. So it gives us a little bit more sense of what sophistry is. We can move these terms around even more to get a, other relationships to help us more. For example, we can take the two arts and put them together, justice and legislation, and then we can take the two forms of flattery, rhetoric and sophistry, and put them together. And then we get justice is to legislation as rhetoric is to sophistry. And we can see what this relationship would be. Now, justice ideally is the basis, or it's what guides legislation. And so rhetoric then would be the basis or what guides sophistry. And so now you can start to see the relationships. And you can do that with the bodily ones as well. Okay, so for those of you who are going to actually read the dialogue, and I always encourage that, um, I do, I give a nice overview, I, at least I hope I do, but um, of course I have to miss a lot because if we were to go through the whole dialogue line for line, it would take a very long time. So there's a lot that I miss, and I always encourage you to read the dialogue for yourself. If you do read the dialogue, I recommend that you have this format in mind, whether you use this exact format or you make your own. Um, he does refer to some of these terms again later in the dialogue, and so it's good to keep these relationships in mind. So uh, that's why I spent a few minutes developing it. Okay, now from here, Socrates is going to make his first case defending those two paradoxes. And here they are again, just to remind you of what they are. It's better to be wronged than to do wrong. And for those who do wrong, it's better to be punished than to get away with it. 
Okay, he's going to argue this by building up to another one of his maxims, which is that everything we do is for the sake of the good. He says even in mundane activities, like in the pursuit of the good then, it is, in the, I'm sorry, it is in the pursuit of the good then that we walk when we walk, thinking this is a better course. And when on the contrary we stand, we stand for the same reason, for the sake of the good, is it not? So everything we do is for the sake of the good, from the most mundane notions of good, such as standing and walking, to our deepest feelings of morality, for example, and virtue. So all is based on virtue. Everything we do is for virtue and for goodness. Um, he's then going to go on from here, then, to make his case that to do wrong is the greatest of evils. And by the way, I just want to point out here that the word evil sometimes comes up in Plato's dialogues. It depends on the translator, but it comes up often. It's not understood in the same context as it is in Christianity, because there is no devil in Platonic metaphysics and in Platonic um, mythology. Or, or excuse me, in Greek mythology. Um, there's no devil figure. Hades was the overlord, we would say, of the afterworld, which included not only Tartarus, which would be sort of um, equivalent to hell, but also he was the overlord of the Isles of the Blessed, which would be the, the equivalent of heaven. So, And he was not seen as an evil figure. So there is no power of the same magnitude. Um, ignorance does have a power to it, but it's not an ultimate reality. And it doesn't have that same connotation. So you could replace evils here with ignorance, that to do wrong is the greatest of ignorance. And it's based on this idea that Socrates then believes that doing wrong with impunity is no great fate. And he's going to go on to make that case. At this point, he's not really defending it. He's just stating it. And the first objection he's going to get, the first strong objection, is from that student of Gorgias who we met briefly earlier, Polis. And Polis is a bit cocky. He says, well, obviously you'll say that you do not know whether the great king himself is happy. To which Socrates replies, And I shall be telling the truth, for I do not know how he stands in education and justice. So what we see here is that for Socrates, the measure of happiness has nothing to do with our conventional notions. We tend to look at people's status in society, their, their resume, um, their wealth, how attractive are they to other people? Uh, these are the things that in conventional circles are looked at as measures of happiness. But for Socrates, that's not at all the case. He looks at a person's education, and here he really means the education of the soul, their education and their justice. Now Polis picks up on this, and he continues by adding, asking, what, does happiness rest entirely upon this? Socrates says, yes, in my opinion, Polis, for the man and woman who are noble and good, I call happy, but the evil and base, I call wretched. Okay, from here, Polis is, he's clearly not convinced. He's going to give the example of the, uh, of a tyrant named Archelaus. Now, Archelaus, we learn, was the son of a slave. However, he stole power in Macedonia, and he stole it rather ruthlessly. He murdered anyone who got in his way. And because of that ruthlessness, he was currently running Macedonia as a tyrant. And so Polis, being again incredulous and a bit sarcastic here, says, So now after committing greater crimes than any in Macedonia, Guess by your logic, Socrates, he must be the most wretched, not the happiest of all Macedonians. In fact, Polis concludes that by Socrates' logic, Archelaus would have been happier as a slave than as the sole leader of Macedonia. Well, Socrates not only defends his position, but he's going to double down on it. He says that the wicked man and the doer of evils is in any case unhappy if he does not meet with justice and suffer punishment. But he's less unhappy if he pays the penalty and he suffers punishment from gods and men. 
Okay, well, on the surface, this gives us something of a paradox because this is certainly not the way that we live. It's not the way that our society is run or what is considered conventional wisdom. And so we have to see why Socrates thinks this way. And now to get into his reasoning, um, I did have some trouble deciding how to organize this because if I were going to give you every single argument piece by piece, it would take a very long time. If I stick to these 20 minute videos, it would mean probably three or four videos. And so what I wanna do instead is talk a little bit about the two interlocutors that he's going to talk to because when you see their states of mind, then it becomes clear why the various discussions unfold the way they do. And then most important of all, of course, is we want to look at Socrates' mindset and to see why these paradoxes, or what seems like paradoxes to some of us, are not at all paradoxes to him. What would the world have to look like through his eyes for him to think that these paradoxes of his are actually the way things really are and the way we all ought to see the world? Okay, so with this in mind, we're going to get into the mindsets of his two interlocutors. And the first of them is Polis. Now, Polis, again, was one of Gorgias' students. And from the opening of the dialogue, we find Polis to be eager to dialogue. But he's also a bit young and cocky and maybe you would say a bit green. Early in the dialogue, Socrates says of Polis, it is obvious from what Polis has said that he is much better versed in what is called rhetoric than in dialogue. Well, knowing what Socrates' opinion of rhetoric was, we can see that this was definitely meant as a critique. Uh, we're going to actually find throughout Polis's exchange with Socrates that he not only is a bit cocky and more caught up in rhetoric than in the true pursuit of wisdom, but he also has a rather conventional point of view. Uh, for example, when Socrates was giving his critiques of rhetoric, Polis was shocked that Socrates had a low opinion of rhetoricians. He asks, are they not the most powerful in their cities? And he goes on to say of rhetoricians, do they not, like tyrants, put to death any man they will? and deprive them of their fortunes and banish whomever it seems best. Now here we may be seeing a little bit of Plato's own bitterness towards Socrates' death, because one of the people who brought charges against Socrates was a rhetorician. And so the rhetoricians were, in some cases, the politicians or the VIPs of society. And they did have a certain power. I mean, they had the power to kill Socrates. They have the kind of power that Polis is talking about. But this is not the kind of power that Socrates is talking about. He's talking about a kind of personal power. And Polis never quite seems to understand that. And so in terms of power, Polis and Socrates are talking at cross purposes. And so as you're reading this dialogue on your own, which again, I do encourage you to do, um, you need to see what Socrates is talking about and how that differs from what Polis is talking about. So the conventional point of view that Polis represents versus the other way of seeing things that Socrates represents. Uh, where Polis really gets tripped up in his uh, conversation with Socrates is his quickness to give that socially acceptable answer. Polis is kind of like that kid in English class in high school who always said the politically correct thing, but you knew he wasn't really like that. So that's Polis. And there's one point where Socrates says, and is it more shameful to do or to suffer wrong? To which Polis very quickly says to do wrong. Well, ideally, this is true. We learn back in kindergarten that our behavior reflects on ourselves. We, but we also know that and this doesn't always really work this way. Society does shame victims. There's a lot of victim shaming going on, whether you're talking about, about victims of uh, sexual assault or you're talking about elderly people who lost their savings to a con artist. You know, they're shamed feeling gullible. 
or even you're talking about, say, that loner in school who gets bullied. Many people won't defend the, that loner because they don't want to be ostracized themselves. So there's a great deal of victim shaming going on. It's still alive and well. And of course, we know that many criminals and abusers are actually proud of what they get away with. They feel powerful and they feel vindicated and they feel justified in what they do. And sometimes actually society celebrates them, especially the bully who is funny, for example. Or we, you know, a lot of those Hollywood movies I mentioned earlier, you know, getting away with something. It's the cleverness of the con artist that is celebrated. So even though objectively we can agree with Polis here, I think we all know that subjectively we often don't actually act this way. And so this is where our next interlocutor comes in, Callicles. Callicles actually calls Polis out for this very thing. He says, I do not think much of Polis for the very reason that he agreed with you, Socrates, that it's more disgraceful to do than to suffer injustice. So Callicles represents that cynical, uh, pragmatic man of the world. He doesn't talk about humans in these flowery, idealistic terms, and, and he never talks about us as spiritual beings the way Socrates does. Instead, he sees humans as social animals vying for wealth and power. So he thinks of himself as someone who knows which way is up, and he unabashedly defends the maxim that might makes right. In fact, he even says it directly. He says that right is recognized to be the sovereignty and advantage of the stronger over the weaker. So it becomes clear through his discussion with Socrates that um, he sees himself as a worldly man, and his ideal is a person of action. But we're going to see that, like with Polis, he and Socrates are going to talk at cross purposes. So they use words like wisdom and courage, but they use them quite differently. And here's an example. Callicles, excuse me, Callicles says, I mean by the more powerful, those who are wise in affairs of the state, and not only wise, but courageous, being competent to accomplish their intentions and not flagging through weakness of soul. So what we're seeing here is that wisdom for Callicles has nothing to do with having a vision of the nature of reality in some spiritual sense. For him, it's in terms of the practical manipulation of the affairs of state. And courage for him has nothing to do with maintaining the health of the soul, which is what Socrates talks about. No, for Callicles, Courage is about being goal-oriented and driven by social power. So Callicles and Socrates are never able to convince one another of their perspective because their mindsets are just too far apart. All right, so let's leave Callicles behind and we'll leave Polis behind as well because it's really Socrates' point of view that we want to understand. So let's see if we can do that. Now within... Um, among Platonists, let's put it this way, among Platonists, there are some of us who see Plato as spiritual, and there are others who see Plato's writings more as agnostic or maybe even atheistic. Sometimes those differences seem rather small, and there's enough to agree on without getting into that debate. But here in this dialogue, we have a clear example of a case where dismissing the spiritual aspects of Plato's dialogues would render this whole dialogue incomprehensible. Now, certainly you could make a moralistic argument in humanist terms, but in order to understand Socrates, we have to see that he was a spiritual man, and he put this in spiritual terms. For him, morality and virtue cannot be separated from wisdom. In fact, wisdom is the first of the virtues, as we, and I talked about that in an earlier video. Um, he tells us that it is then the presence in each thing of the order appropriate to it that makes everything good. Now, we saw earlier, a quote earlier in this talk, 
that everything we do is for the sake of the good, from the most mundane actions like standing and walking to our deepest sense of good in the sense of what is moral and right. And everything is for the sake of the good. And now he's telling us that it is the presence of the order appropriate to it that makes things good. Um, those of you who saw my video on the virtues probably recognize that this was his definition justice. So this is a virtue as well. And he's going to go on to say, the soul then that has its own appropriate order is better than that which has none. I'm going to step back for just a moment because, again, there's a difference in terminology between the way the Platonists used words and the way our understanding is today with our modern Christian way of thinking. Uh, for, for Plato, when we talk about the soul being good or bad, it doesn't have the same connotation as the Christian framework. What he's talking about is the soul being healthy or unhealthy. And so the word better in this quote could be replaced with healthier. And then I think it will be clear to us. The soul then that has its own appropriate order is healthier than that which has none. And I think that gives us a clear understanding of what Socrates was saying. So Socrates briefly summarizes all the virtues at this point. I'm not going to do it here because there is a video about that. And if you haven't seen it already, I do encourage you to watch that. And then he's going to tie all these virtues to goodness. And he says that there is every necessity, Callicles, that the sound-minded and temperate man, meaning here the virtuous person, being as we have demonstrated, just and brave and pious, must be completely good, and the good man must do well in finally whatever he does, and must be happy and blessed. And so this is why Socrates believes that it is better to be wronged than to do wrong, because if your soul is ordered, in other words, healthy, you will carry life's burdens as well as any human could. It doesn't mean that bad things will never happen to you, but you'll carry the burdens as well as you could. But if you do something wrong, if you do wrong, it means that your soul is in some way unordered or unvirtuous. In other words, it's unhealthy. He goes on to say that perhaps the true man should ignore this question of living for a certain span of years and should not be so enamored of life. Just a reminder, Gorgias lived to 105. <clears throat> so Plato is kind of taking a knock at that. That's not the measure of a good life. We should leave those things to God, and trusting the women folk who say that no man whatever could escape his destiny, we should consider the ensuing question, in what way one can best live the life that is to be his. And he's going to end the dialogue by telling us that this is the best way of life, to live and die in the pursuit of righteousness and all other virtues. So Plato, through the character of Socrates, then, is challenging our conventional understandings of a good life. He's daring us to question those initial knee-jerk reactions that we may have had to his seemingly paradoxical position. Next week, I'm going to revisit this dialogue because there's a myth at the end, which I think is worth looking at. It shows us a little bit more of Socrates as the spiritual man. So I do hope you'll join me next week. Thank you very much.